Good evening, everybody. My name is Dominic DiMaria. I'm an agent with Porcupine Real Estate based out of Epping, New Hampshire. Um, my wife and I moved here in 2020. Um, and since then, we've been, uh, since then, I've gotten involved with the real estate market here. And I have a couple of panelists here today. We're going to talk about turnkey investing with income properties in New Hampshire. Uh, so today I'm joined by Mark Warden from Porcupine Real Estate. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Mark. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah, Mark Warden here. I'm an early free state project mover from 2007. And I founded the firm Porcupine Real Estate. We are a very, uh, let's say, a niche firm, a boutique real estate firm catering to free state project movers and libertarian types around the country are looking for investment properties in New Hampshire. And I've owned a number of uh, rental properties over the years in Southern California, Southern Nevada and here in New Hampshire. So happy to discuss the pros and cons of those. If there are any questions about that tonight. Great. And, and I'm also joined with uh, by Brittany Ping from Ledgeview Commercial Partners. Awesome. So my name is Brittany Ping. I'm also an early mover from 2012. Um, I have been in real estate since uh, mid-2017. Uh, my husband uh, created this brokerage. We're at nine years in. Um, and we focus on multifamily third-party property management. So we do investment purchasing and we do investment managing uh, through the long term. So that's my job. I do the day-to-day -day of uh, real estate property management. Excellent. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about some opportunities and what to look for uh, when doing turnkey investing. And uh, with that said, uh, if anybody has questions as we go along, please feel free to put them in the chat. And our moderator, Amy, will uh, ask those towards the end of the discussion. So um, being a relatively new mover, uh, having been here for only two years, I'm still getting to know the area of New Hampshire. Um, I am very familiar with the Seacoast area now. Um, and actually with real estate in general, um, I've been all over the state. Uh, but I do get this question quite a bit from people. Um, what are the best towns for rental properties here in New Hampshire? So at Ledgeview, we focus on the Manchester Concord corridor. So we are pretty niche in the largest parts of the populace of the state. So we do have a little bit of like a single family or a multifamily in Nashua or Salem, and that very Southern edge. But we say so South Central. Um, and that corridor between, because that's a bulk of your population. It's, you know, about 15 to 20% of the population reside there, and that works for us. And is that something that would be um, prohibitive to people who are looking to get into investments? Is it, does Absolutely it more? Absolutely not. I don't think they need to stick here at all. I think that the Upper Valley, when you're talking about, um, you know, the, the Lebanon area, if you're talking about the seacoast, I mean, really the seacoast starts from Manchester all the way out to uh, Hampton Beach, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of housing opportunity. We've just kind of stayed niche in about 20% of the market, but the other 80%, I don't, I don't really think there's a bad rental location. I know people who do rentals in Berlin on their own and they love it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of development on the south side of the state you know, even when you're talking about South of Keene, not necessarily where we would consider large populations, um, but just the amount of need and the supply and the demand for housing is still successful out there from a rental standpoint. I have heard that the uh, rental rate in New Hampshire is incredibly high. Is it still the case? So I moved from Indianapolis in 2012, and it was a similar price point. So it is kind of hard thinking about, I moved from a city of 1 million or a state, yeah, a city of 1 million to a state of roughly 1 million. Um, but the rental price points were very similar. There are, um, you can see on a map of the state that there are pockets of lower rents. But if you're moving from a very low rent state where you have high taxes elsewhere, then this is going to be a sticker shock. Um, but I moved from a high tax state into a low tax state and my rent stayed the same. Yeah, we were in a similar situation. We moved from Western New York and my taxes were so incredibly high for everything. Uh, and then moving here, you know, the initial sticker shock, like you were saying, of buying a property was a, a, quite a shock with seeing how much we took from the sale of our house, bringing it to here, and then seeing how it didn't really go very far. 
Um, but in general, I pay roughly the same amount and I live in a much nicer area now. So. And Dominic, I might add that one of the things about this slide here says best towns for rental properties, mm -hmm. but we can differentiate between single family houses and multifamily. And oh. if you're from out West, uh, you'll be surprised at how many three unit buildings, triplexes, four unit buildings there are up in particular in the mill towns. These were towns that were built up over 100 years ago, typically along major rivers. So the Merrimack Valley towns of Nashua, Manchester and Concord, Lava Bunch, Franklin. And then uh, you have some in other parts of the state as well. Those are great for multifamilies, affordable old brick buildings. But you know, if you're looking at a single family house, if you want to put an Airbnb pool, you know, that's a different calculus. Uh, if, if your clients want to be in the city, so you're on city water and sewer, that's one way to look at it. But it, people uh, might pay a premium to be in a, a rural setting where maybe they can have a horse on their property and uh, some farming area. So it really depends on the investment characteristics of the investor and the buyer himself. And uh, we can help you with that as well. Very good. Anything else we want to add to best towns for rentals? I mean, it really comes down to where you want to live. If you're if you're planning on owner occupying or something along those lines, um, you know, you've got to decide what's best for you. But if it's straight income, um, definitely around those more densely populated towns of New Hampshire. Or I think it's saying like what Mark is saying, right? If you're if you're saying, hey, I want to be a part of the Upper Valley development, right? Maybe I have an interest in that area and maybe that's where I want to move in five to 10 years. Buying a single family home in the Upper Valley, there's a shortage of homes, you know, for rent when a doctor decides they want to, you know, go work at Dartmouth. So there, you know, I can say that's not the best bang for your buck, but it absolutely could be a slam dunk for an investor in the long term for a, a single family. And then Mark touched on this briefly with the different types of buildings. Um, so what we're referring to is more like um, condos versus multifamilies versus single families. Um, for somebody just getting into investing, where would you say is a good place to start? So I personally love our New England triplexes, our three family flats, our triple deckers, you know, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're very... Um, much a piece of the history of the industrial revolution and that development. Um, you know, the home that I live in, it was given to a family by the Amiskeg Mill Company. They said, build a multifamily, we'll give you the land for free. Um, and so that's how a lot of these homes came into being. Um, it's a great investment, you know, opportunity, whether it's owner occupancy and, you know, two units can pay your mortgage or even a three family, right? Having that third rental income coming in um, you know, if you can find a four family, they're not as common, at least not in Manchester, um, but that's still considered a residential mortgage. You know, so if you're looking to stay with a residential mortgage, a three or four family is just an excellent um, uh, and first time investment, in my opinion. And we and that, should also note too, for anybody who is going through a pre-approval and interested in doing this kind of uh, investing, uh, it is a different loan than just a single family house, a uh, single family loan. Um, so you do want to talk to your lender uh, about the options there uh, and what you can actually afford. So, Mark, you were going to say something? Yeah, I'll add that if, if our investors want to support what we're doing here in the Free State Project or the Free State Movement in New Hampshire, Net Manchester is a fantastic city because there's so many of us here. It's a great landing pad for people moving here from out of state. But if you're just looking for a long-term play uh, with high occupancy rates, Nashua is, is a great town. I wouldn't want to live there, but you're always going to be able to rent it out. It's right over the border from Massachusetts and that huge employer base that's in Northern Mass. So anywhere along the Southern border of the state, you'll do fine with a rental property. And Salem, Salem is an excellent developing community. They're going to be building condos. They're going to be building homes. Merrimack is very similar. Merrimack has built a lot of housing in a short amount of time. Um, anything that's kind of that 20 minutes away from the, the Massachusetts border, you're not, I, I came like, you know, I'm not saying you can't go wrong, but looking in those areas, you're going to have a little bit more um opportunity to be ensured that you have the labor pool to support rent rates. 
And then as far as other types of buildings go, um, what are the benefits of owning like, uh, if, if somebody can't afford to do like a three unit, is it okay to start with a condo for something like a rental? I think so. If you if you know how to read through HOA docs, if if you're going in with an, you know, informed about, you know, what your mortgage looks like versus your HOA expenses, you just take right off the top a lot of your maintenance costs and you already, you know, know what that looks like because you're really only responsible for what's inside of those walls. Um, and so it does alleviate a lot of concerns. You're not responsible for who's going to plow most of the time. You're not responsible for the heating systems a good amount of the time. You're not providing, you know, uh, washer dryer connections and, and things like that. It's a common area facility. Um, and they get extra amenities that you might not be able to provide, you know, in a three family on a tenth of an acre. So I don't think um, we have we have quite a few, probably about 15, you know, just single condos out there that we manage that do well. Great. Now, so the slide up here says uh, putting a unit into uh, short-term rentals or Airbnbs. How often um, do people approach you with that kind of scenario? So this isn't something that we do. So this in New Hampshire requires a room and meals tax. So we don't we don't dip our toe into that specific piece. Um, I would say that we have um, a fair amount in Manchester, but this is a lot more common as you get into kind of our suburbs or up even farther north in kind of like the lakes regions and things like that. Um, I think this is an excellent option. There are management companies that specialize in it if you don't wanna do it on your own. Um, but if you're semi-local, you can find companies and organizations that will help you, you know, control from a vendor standpoint. Um, but I, I would say this is a decent part of our market. It's a much more intense part of the market towards that actual mid to upper tier of the state. Mark, what's been your experience with uh, selling homes to people who wanna use them for short-term rentals? What I've seen work out really well is a multifamily house, let's say a duplex or a single family house with an in-law suite. We've had a number of our clients that have been very successful with living in the main part of the house and then renting out the, what we call an ADU or accessory dwelling unit, a granny flat, the in-law suite. That can be very uh, lucrative. In many cases, the overall income is greater than it would be for a long-term rental in the same space. But what's even better is that you have a lot of flexibility. So if you have family visiting uh, during the holidays, for example, you can just keep it open for them and take it out of the short-term rental pool. I have um, a guy who owns three different buildings, two in Concord, one in Plymouth, and he's doing very well with short-term rentals. And then we have a friend who manages um, Airbnb and short-term rentals, and he prefers big houses in the ski resorts and other, let's say, recreational or um, tourism areas. So it really depends on your personality, your style, how much time you're willing to put into it personally. But I think these are all nice options for somebody, particularly if you want to uh, be part of our community and have that space available for more porcupines or you know more more private use than just keeping it rented full time. And I think one of the pieces that's not on here that's becoming a, a kind of an in between between the short term rental and our traditional leasing is you talk about like the traveling nurses, right? Um, or those kind of professions where they're called into our into our high density areas for a specific job for a shorter period of time, and so you'll see a lot of targeted marketing. Um, and I think that's an opportunity as well for investors that we're gonna see become more and more because of the labor shortages in New Hampshire that we're gonna see like four month leases for traveling professionals that are in furnished units. And so it's kind of a nice mix for someone that's self-managing or even you know a traditional management company to manage for you because you're not necessarily doing those 30 days or shorter leases. And so you're not in that room and meals area either. Yeah, because I've noticed a lot that um, there are a lot of seasonal rentals in New Hampshire where it's like, um, you know, if somebody has a house up in the mountains or something like that and they want to use it for a specific portion of the year, they'll lease it out for the rest of the year. So those pop up in the MLS quite a bit. So. All right. So market rent for two bedroom units. 
Um, seems like it's going up pretty steadily. Has that been, uh, what has yeah. been your experience with that? Yeah, so I asked Amy to use this metric and she was like, just talk about rents. And I was like, well, this is the base. Well, this is what the government uses when they say, talk about affordability um, in our area. So this is um, Manchester market rents and you can see what it's done um, over the past uh, seven years there. Um, I called HUD's numbers in 2021 and 2022 pretend numbers. Um, we saw basically that shoot. <laughs> they just pretended during COVID. I don't know what they were doing. It's not what the market actually looks like. And so we saw a really big adjustment from 22 to 23. Um, you know, it kind of looks a little stair-steppy there, but it really was pretty aggressive. Um, you know, in 20, but 21 into 22, that's when we had that really low zero, basically 0% 0 vacancy rate in Manchester. Um, we look like we're still heading that way for 23, 24. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, you can see it, it's only kind of increased. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going anywhere. And that's just a two bedroom, right? So on average, a uh, two bedroom right now, 1647 is considered fair market rent. Okay. So that's your BC class housing. That's not luxury housing. So uh, just thinking with that in mind, when you're looking at investing, what does that mean to own a two bedroom unit? It's about 1650 a month in rent. And then so, Brittany, if, if it's a three bedroom, is it $200 more, for example? And if it's a one bedroom, $200 less in ballpark? I mean, so off the top of my head, I want to say it's like 18 uh, is somewhere around the HUD number. I could look it up specifically, but right now we're starting about 1800 is kind of what you consider to be a three bedroom on average. And just to educate the, anybody who may not know what the what you're talking about as far as HUD numbers go, so that's a resource that's available? Yeah, so this is the federal government. Um, Ledger Commercial actually participates in our New Hampshire rental survey data for this. Um, so they do collect uh, data in from landlords and listings about um, what market rents look like. And then they create um, what's the 50th percentile. And then fair market rent is about 40th percentile of market rent. So this is considered the fair market rent value, where if you were to go look for an apartment that's a two bedroom in general, the fair market rent would be 1646. Um, and and this, is, this is part of like the calculator of can I afford that area? Um, it all comes from the HUD data, housing and urban development. And we'll remind our friends and viewers that this is just a statewide average. So of course it's going to vary from town to town, just like all real estate. If you get down to Nashua, it'd be a little bit more than this because you're closer to the border. If you get up in Berlin or the North Country, it's gonna be less. Dover, Portsmouth are getting pretty pricey, so they'll be higher. Rochester maybe a little bit less. So talk to your your realtor and your property manager to get a, a more localized idea of the rents. Yeah, so this is somebody... just specifically Manchester. So right. So if somebody came to you with uh, a duplex that they had just purchased and said, I want you to manage this for me, how would you, what does that process look like? Do they just show you what they have for numbers and then you kind of come up with the math? I mean, I would say that most of our investors kind of have an idea. Um, I have a CMA tool that I use for rentals. Um, so it's been something that's just kind of grown and changed with what we have. Um, and I get like eight numbers. You know, I always say like, it's an art, not a science. And so I'll say like, oh, okay, uh, you know, your two bedroom unit is anywhere from 1500 to 1742, right? Where do we actually want to be, right? Did we just do a whole bunch of updates and improvements and it's beautiful, gorgeous? We're going to go really high end. That's above FMR, but, you know, we're going to pull in the kind of person that you want for that brand new unit. Or if you're saying like, Brittany, keep the 1990s shag carpet. I do not have the money to put in, you know, $10,000 of new flooring throughout. How do you feel about 1500? How do you feel about 1550? How do you feel about 1560? Like, let's talk about what those amounts mean um, and how that looks in the market too. Because sometimes if you price too low, if you're like, I only need to make 3000. Okay, well you with your duplex, <laughs> we're leaving money on the table and we might look not great, right? We might not look like we are providing a market value unit and therefore, we might get looked over by someone who's an excellent fit for your unit. They might say something's wrong if it's 100 to $200 less than the competition. Another important factor is if the heat is included. And yeah. you'll see that in some of these older buildings where they haven't separated the heating systems out. So that's including the rent. So, of course, they're going to charge more 
another factor to look at if you're whether you're an investor or seeking a rental housing unit is whether uh, off street park is included. So these are all yeah. little factors that will adjust the monthly rent. Yeah, so my analysis is based on like square footage, parking, uh, utilities included, um, what floor it's on, um, you know, because we, a lot of ours are walk-ups. Um, if they have an additional storage space, um, that's uncommon. Um, if they have utilities on site, like a washer dryer, um, you know, those types of things. And then, and then it's all, honestly, I keep a whole bunch of HUD data in there as well. And, you know, just kind of turn it through based on what the government thinks. <laughs> we all love that, right? <laughs> am I, am I, am I there? Um, and then also, honestly, uh, we get a preview of what our cities are and our towns are doing for our tax rate. And so usually at the very end, I'll add an adjustment for what the expected tax rate is. Um, one of the other things is, is water sewer included. Um, so you cannot charge back if it's a single meter to multiple units. Um, so in Manchester, again, we got a 9% unexpected increase in water rates. Um, so that does factor into um, my analysis as well. So when HUD gives you this average, is that, that's literally the average, right? I mean, so it can be units that don't have the sewer, water and sewer and yeah. have the heat. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah, this is just like, if you're like, I don't know where to start, what should I be looking at? Finding the HUD for your area is my first recommendation. Gotcha. If you have a 600 square foot two bedroom with nothing included, it might not be 1600 square feet, right? Right. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and then financing options. Um, do you, so does Ledgeview do anything with uh, helping folks find lenders or anything in that respect? Yeah, I, we're definitely not as big of as a buy sell brokerage um, as something like Porcupine Real Estate, right? Because we do the investment and management. Um, so it's the investment purchasing and management, but we have good relationships with credit unions um, and banks uh, throughout the area. Um, you know, obviously because of what we do and how much we investment we hold <laughs> um, and work with. Um, so we have, uh, I probably want to say six or seven banks that we're on good contact with. Um, I know that Liz Going, Chris Nado, uh, Charlie, you know, it's kind of those same people um, that you know are on top of their game and that you can say like, hey, have you talked to Liz? Hey, have you talked to Charlie? Hey, have you talked to Chris? Um, that's absolutely one of the things they're doing. And then something like, you know, I started an account with Bellwether Credit Union because I know that that's an excellent lending opportunity for an investment. Um, you know, just encouraging when you have an investment property maybe set yourself up with a new credit union. So the next time you want to do the same thing, you've got, you know, that opportunity to go right to the credit union as a member that's, you know, established yourself. Hmm. Mark, anything to add to that? No, that was perfect, Brittany. Thanks. Other than we know for different uh, rental properties, investment properties, you might need more down payment than it would be for a single family owner occupied uh, property. So talk with your realtor, talk with your lender to get the, the, the uh, specifics on those because they can vary widely from property to property. So in, yeah. every once in a while, there'll be a situation where one of the properties that you currently manage will be coming up onto the market or something along those lines. And you that's a great situation to be in because you have all the financial data to show that it's a good investment. So that could be something that could interest people going forward. Um, if you are looking at getting into the 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 real estate market in Manchester or one of those areas that you guys cover. Yeah. And I mean, we can produce year over year reports, super easy. You know, you can make it as informative as you want or as secretive as you want, right? You know, what somebody else spends on maintenance, would spend on maintenance isn't necessarily what you would, but you can show that revenue. Um, so our clients really have a lot of, you know, that white glove kind of hand holding for when it comes to that point of, I want to sell, right? What would it look like? for an investor to want to buy my unit. And they can see it right from that perspective because we have that data, right? And then, you know, I am not, <laughs> I've sold one single family home. <laughs> our, our client really loved me and was like, can you just do this with me? And I said, okay, we're gonna do this together. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but Matthew and his background, you know, he's been doing this for 18 years. And so, you know, him having the knowledge and experience and then backing it up with just his immediate reporting for an owner to say, absolutely, we're, you know, this is what we can show with an investor has this question. 
um, it's all built in from a property management standpoint. Uh, great. Yeah. So basically what it comes down to is if you're thinking about getting into it, the first step would be to talk to a lender and see what you can actually afford. And then we can go from that point, really. And so, like Mark said, if you're doing a conventional, um, so same thing, I did a conventional loan a few years ago, there, there was different kinds of loans I could take as well. And so it, having those conversations with different lenders, you know, I think that's one of the things we all recommend because you may want something that's more uh, commercial looking, even though it's a, you know, a residential level conventional loan um, versus a more traditional looking residential loan, even though you're paying that 20% down. Um, so that was a fun kind of experience for me personally, going between those two when I was looking at buying an investment property. Hmm. So we'll just go over some of the pros and cons of investing here in New Hampshire. Um, so in, you can, uh, one of the positive points here is to invest in the free state without having to move. So if you're kind of dipping your toe into the whole free state project and you're not sure if you actually want to live here, you're happy with what you're doing where you are, you could buy a property, have it managed completely hands off by Ledgeview and still be part of the movement, um, but have nothing here in the state that you're staying in. Um, some passive income. Um, we do always recommend people who are moving here, if it is an option for you, to try to get a multifamily under your belts. Um, it's a nice steady income, which is a great option. Um, cash flow. Can you can you explain what cash flow means? So that means that you are um, generating more in rents than you are spending on a monthly basis. Uh, so Ledgy Commercial. We actually pay ourselves based, uh, it's a pretty simple fee structure. The hardest part is you pay me on what I collect for rent because I know that you want money coming in. Um, we do a break-even maintenance philosophy because I want you to keep uh, improved units so that the rents can keep coming in at a good amount. Um, and so cash flow is just meaning that you should be receiving a monthly dispersion from Ledgeview Commercial. Uh, um, you know, right at the beginning of each month. And, you know, if you want to really think about it and deep dive in, you can. And if you just want that nice passive uh, cash flow um, where it's paying your mortgage, it's paying your water sewer, it's paying your escrow, um, it's paying all those things, it's 100% possible. And appreciation? So hopefully we all hope, right, that <laughs> especially as we, you know, pay off those mortgages, our homes are worth more than what we bought them for. Um, and obviously we're looking at the market that we are um, and uh, it's it knock on wood. I don't want to, you know, burst anyone's <laughs> bubble, but in New Hampshire, we are still at a point where the supply is so much less than the demand um, that, uh, you know, I'm not concerned in regards to the growth potential of property here. Um, and once you have that appreciation, you could pull um, a HELOC, right? You could pull, um, you know, against your home. Uh, you could, you know, get a construction loan for those larger items. So you're not trying, so you're not dipping into cash flow for CapEx, um, that kind of stuff. And I've, I've heard it said quite a few times from the, the folks that I've worked with who've bought multifamilies um, that it's uh, it's addicting. So like you buy one and then you want another and then you want another. And then before you know it, you've got so many that you need somebody else to manage them because it's it's too many. Yeah, it's like, I think 12 is a little too many. You know, if you have 12 units or more, just call me, it's fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then tax advantages. How does this, uh, how how does tax work with multifamilies that are being managed? Is it any different? So we um, provide the 1099 at the end. Um, usually the first year that someone's in a management client with us, um, our broker will do a conversation with the CPA like, oh, hey, here's what, uh, is deferred. We categorize all the GLs, so it should be really easy for your tax professional, right? This is a one-time expense. These are depreciating expenses. These are plumbing expenses. Um, so we try to code it so it all makes sense. Sometimes your tax professionals don't agree with you that your roof should just be written off on the year of taxes. That happened to me. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, it really should make it easy for you. Um, if you're doing it all on your own, it might take a little bit more time back and forth. But what we found, um, you know, a lot of people who own multi, not all of them will put it in an LLC as well. And so you do have an additional protection from a tax standpoint 
um, if that's how you're receiving that additional cash flow. And I'll add to that, Dominic, without getting too much in the weeds, that the single biggest um, benefit to owning a, a rental property like this in regards to taxes has to do with depreciation. And that means that on paper, the you can write off uh, depreciation of the physical asset over so many years. And that helps reduce the reported income. So you may have a positive cash flow of 1500 a month, for example, 18,000 a year, but your depreciation based on the IRS schedule is um, $8,000 of depreciation. So now you're paying taxes on the 10,000 of income on paper and not the full 18,000. So that's a huge benefit. Now, we are real estate professionals. We are not tax experts. So here comes the obligatory <laughs> disclaimer. Please consult your own individual tax expert or attorney regarding these things. But that's one of the beautiful things about real estate investment that a lot of people don't know about. And especially if you have a property management, right? Like it's like, I remember my mom keeping the receipts for everything she bought for our house to write off, right? Um, when it was a, a rental, you know, we keep all of that. It's all done. Um, you know, it's just, it's a thing that you hand over to your tax professional or accountant, or if you are um, insane and do them on your own, you know, I'm not here to judge you, but you're a special kind of human. Um, you know, it, it's all there. Um, and again, we use uh, the, we use uh, gap accounting just to make it easy as well. And the occupancy rates, again, we had stated earlier uh, today that um, it, it's very far hard to find a rental in New Hampshire currently, and it's not getting any easier. There's just um, not a whole lot of inventory and, you know, the prices are, they vary from area to area, but uh, you will not have any issues renting your place out. Yeah, and the unemployment rates here are some of the lowest in the country as well. Or um, I'm sorry, not um, employment rates are some of the highest, right? So we have a, a active working workforce that is actively looking for housing. Um, so it's a it's a net positive. Now for the stuff that we don't want to talk about, but we should address. Uh, so the cons. Um, how about people who don't pay or pay late um, on their rent? So I think that's the benefit of, you know, what we do. So we have created a system where if people are going to pay late. I want to know sooner rather than later. Um, you know, we create a method for everyone to kind of have the same option to pay late. They put a little bit of skin in the game um, and then they make the payment by the end of that month. Um, uh, you know, making sure your lease clauses, if you're self-managing, say rent, um, overdue rents will not be tolerated or using a lawyer to kind of create that language um, so that there's no uncertain cloud over when rent is due and how much rent is. Um, our courts are pretty balanced, landlord tenant, um, you know, but having clear, clear lease terms in regards to when rent, rent is due, when it is late, and when you will move forward with an eviction notice um, is all really important. Um, and anything in writing in the state of New Hampshire um, about rental amounts and when they can be expected is it, it's it's definitely a piece to to navigate. And I would say, like we manage three hundred and twenty five units. I would say that, you know, we see maybe about ten to fifteen percent pay late. Um, and maybe go through the initial part of the demand for rent process, which is seven days elimination period um, before we get rent in full. So it's really only one or two people per month that'll get ourselves up to court, but now they have until that court date to pay their balance. Oh, okay. How often does it happen where you have to actually evict somebody? Is that a common, not common? It's not very common. Um, we have a few right now in the system, but that's because our cap assistance just stopped um, so New Hampshire federal funding for rental stopped on October 21st. Um, so we're seeing the very last of those checks come out. And so anyone who's always relied on that federal assistance for rentals that 18 months, we are starting to see those. Um, I think I've got two or three waiting to be delivered with the sheriff, but I haven't had one in like three months. So, even, uh, you know, a large portfolio, it's just not that common. Sure. We would have much higher vacancy rates. 
Uh, and then as far as maintenance issues go, the, the can be pretty costly for your um, average person. How does that factor into uh, when you're using a maintenance company like you guys, management company? Yeah, so I think the number the number one thing is leaks, right? Leaks are your most common and can be your most expensive. Um, so I don't know if we're going to talk about, you know, the value of a home inspection. Um, Mark and I have talked about that when we've talked about, you know, investing in New Hampshire before. You know, just understanding that you might have a hundred year old cast iron pipe, right? What does that mean when that fails? And it's not going to fail a little bit. Sorry, if somebody kind of creeping in my storefront. It's fine. Okay, I know him. <laughs> um, uh, but leaks, leaks and leaks. Those are your most common things. Um, you know, just being prepared, uh, you know, remembering that you have a hundred year old plumbing or could have a hundred year old plumbing and saving up for those CapEx. Um, you know, finding out either if you're not gonna use a property management company, um, what does it look like to get somebody out to an emergency call in the area that I'm, you know, owning a rental in? Um, you know, if it's just one guy, that you know responds to everything. Uh, he might be really nice and cheap, but he might not come out to you on a Sunday. Um, you know, so we mix big companies and small companies and in-house maintenance uh, to try to mitigate the overall maintenance cost. Um, but if anyone's like, what what could cost? You know, if at a turn, you're talking paint, floors. You know, maybe um, like a bathroom vanity, um, maybe a kitchen cabinet, something like that. Drywall repairs normal, or something. Yeah, like those that. aren't your normal repairs. Mm -hmm. I would say if you say like, what's a normal thing that's going to cost you money? Leaks, leaks, and leaks. You know, somebody's <laughs> flooding the unit downstairs. A cast iron pipe went, you know, uh, exploded, or a, a small leak in a um, turn off a shut off valve. Um, you know, they're just the un unprecedented, unexpected. Just giving yourself a capex fund. Uh, is going to save you all the headache of that kind of con. Uh, so we talked about evictions and then lead paint, snow removal, and city inspection. So lead paint uh, here in New England, we do have, um, I wouldn't say it's prevalent, but there is definitely a chance because there are so many older homes here in New England. Um, so how often have you, uh, Mark, you've been here for quite some time, both of you have, how often have you seen lead paint come up in uh, scenarios where people are buying houses? It's certainly a concern and something we shall be aware of, whether you're selling or buying or renting or leasing. Um, and it's it's a serious problem for our young children in particular who ingest lead paint or other lead-based um, elements. So we want to be aware of it. And any good responsible landlord will want to make sure that his uh, building is maintained which means you know, try to avoid peeling, chipping paint, keep uh, your maintenance and your painting updated. Uh, but if unfortunately one of your tenants gets tested uh, and has a very high a lead, blood level of lead, then you're gonna have to, uh, that will be reported to the state and they'll put a lien on your property. And you're gonna have to mitigate it, which can either be removing all the lead paint and replacing all the doors and windows, or it could be, as simple as just encapsulating it in a special type of paint. But we want all of our clients to be very aware of this. We're, we don't want to harm children. We want to protect your investment and more importantly, protect children. So uh, be aware of this up front and use some simple practices such as maintain your property well that can avoid these problems down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, pregnant women, right? Women of pregnancy age as well are also at risk. And so things like gardening too, right? And so. Um, that's one of the things I, so I'm working, uh, I've got two properties going voluntarily through a lead abatement program, uh, and I've got one under lead order. So I've worked with, um, you know, kind of both sides, and I've gone through a voluntary lead abatement on my multifamily as well. Um, you know, you can think that you know where lead paint is. Um, it's kind of one of those things, right? Uh, you just, you just have to, like Mark said, you just making sure that you if you're buying a building that's not been upkept very well, that you're going to make that commitment. There are cleaners that you can use um, to remove residue before you start painting. Um, making sure that you're reading, like how much paint am I disrupting? How much danger am I putting myself and my tenants or my future tenants in by touching this? It's a really serious 
um, thing to think about. Um, and children under the age of two are required to get a blood test in the state of New Hampshire. And so it's not if you would see that report, but one day you will. And you hope that, you know, you're doing the work up front um, to prevent that poisoning from happening to a child. What's and the average, so, uh, so the uh, customers know the official cutoff according to HUD, or I'm sorry, according to EPA, is 1978. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything built after 1978 or later is presumed to have no lead paint in it. So we're talking about the buildings built before 1978, which, as we mentioned earlier, is pretty common here in New Hampshire. Yeah, and like it's not as big of a concern. So the reason we make sure that everybody knows, like, hey, this is a concern, is because in in the 90s it was supposed to be gone, right? Landlords had an obligation to just get rid of it before the 90s, or they would start to be penalized by these types of things that we're talking about right now. And in Massachusetts, you're not allowed to have a rental that's not gone through a lead safe certification. At least that's oh, wow. the best of my understanding. I'm not licensed in Mass, um, but that's to the best of my knowledge. In Massachusetts, they all have to be lead safe certified. That is not the case here. Um, uh, or you might have where you're buying a unit and one unit and the common area are lead safe certified and the rest of the unit is not because the order was only for one unit. Um, so it's just paying attention, knowing what that language means, knowing why we're so serious about those disclosures. And then uh, snow removal, uh, again, it's New England, we get snow, uh, <laughs> quite a bit of snow. Um, I'm from Western New York originally, so uh, I'm used to like lake effect snow, which yeah. I was surprised when I moved here, we don't get quite as much, but we do get a lot of ice. Um, but we do get a, a, a fair amount of snow. Um, do you, uh, so does property maintenance or uh, management, do they do that? Is that something that you guys offer or? So we offer snow plowing as a convenience. So they'll come just for overall management of snow, right? So if eight inches fall, I can't just be like, everyone just shovel your way out, have fun. And then we do it for emergency egress as well. So we'll make sure that all of our common area paths are shoveled out. Um, so that way tenants have a safe way to egress out to the street. Um, but, you know, sometimes we have snow that's expected to be 10 inches and it's one, or, you know, they're expecting one inch and it's 10. Um, right. we get a lot of snow, we, we send a lot of reminders and updates. Um, but snow removal, I mean, in Manchester, it's kind of like a $350 a year. It's not really intense. Um, I'm sure the farther up North that you go, um, you know, where your snow is a lot more accumulative, um, it might be a lot worse, but in the cities, it's a little bit harder, you know, a comprehensive snow removal plan, it, where do you put it? <laughs> sure, very you true. You don't. Um, and so city inspections, anything to add about that? So I actually really, so for a lot of the things that we just talked about, these maintenance issues, these lead paint concerns, making sure these older units are put up to date, I actually really like what Manchester did um, and there's a stark difference, I think, and I, I don't know if you guys have seen when you're looking at a, a multifamily in Manchester than other areas of the state, and that's because the city does come in every three years. Um, they're worried about health safety, and they're worried about a minimum code enforcement. Hmm. So do you meet the minimum code standards, and we'll give you that certificate of occupancy for the next three years. So it's not just, hey, here is one and done. Right, you know, you know, Mr. New T landlord, you get your certificate of occupancy, you can rent out three units. City of Manchester says it's only good for this amount of time. Um, it is uh like a $75 fee if they have to come out more than two times, you just get charged again that same amount. Um it is absolutely a Manchester City bureaucrat coming into every single unit. Um, there was a great R um there was a great one um, saying if there was an if it's an owner occupied unit, you don't have to go into that unit um, for a city inspection. I do like that. Um, you know, if somebody who's owner occupied, you don't need to come into my space. Um, you know how I'm not renting it to someone else. I'm renting it to me. Um, so I personally like it. It is absolutely inviting the government into your home. It is absolutely an additional city municipal fee. Um, but I feel like it keeps the bad actors honest. Um, and it was a big um, 
you know, we had an, a 46% jump in market rents in about two years here in Manchester. And the code enforcement, you know, all these landlord bad articles came out and people were saying, oh, we've been crying about this to the city. Um, and, you know, code enforcement was able to say like, I've had no complaint about, you know, XXX Rimmon Street in four years. You know, our last COC had minimal violations. So there's that. Um, and in my perspective as well, if, if you're not in Manchester or a more involved um, or code, code enforcement, to know really what they do. Um, so like we were, um, we had some management properties down in Nashua and we got a complaint-based introduction to the Nashua city code enforcement. And it was a lot different right? It's a lot less of a friendly relationship. They don't know your buildings. They are looking for every violation. Um, so just kind of understanding from that colloquial perspective of like, what is your code enforcement like? You know, are they going to hit every, every nail right into the ground when they come out for an issue? Um, are they going to work with us? Um, so that's kind of the, the, the positives and negatives of Manchester having the really aggressive city inspection um, versus what, at least what I've experienced in other rental towns where code enforcement is complaint based only and it can be a lot more aggressive. Uh, so that kind of wraps up what we were planning on talking about today. Um, do we have any questions from the crowd, Amy? Nothing on my end. Okay, well, we'll give it a few minutes. I'm going to swing it over to the last slide here with our contact information. Uh, if you found anything that we talked about tonight useful or you'd like more information, feel free to reach out to any of us here. Um, we'll be glad to answer questions or help you along the way, uh, give lender recommendations or just share personal experiences of what we've had in the market. Um, Brittany, if they're interested in utilizing your services, at Ledgeview, how is the is this the best way to get in touch with you or? Absolutely, I might um, hand you off to one of our um, leasing agents here on the office um, who kind of do that client onboarding. But uh, really, kind of from that, hey, do we actually fit what you're looking for and reviewing our contract? They come back to me as the director of property management to bring their properties into the fold. Um, so you do a, a little bit offsite with Tom, uh, and then come right back to me as your primary contact. Great. Anything from you, Mark? I'll remind people that we're fairly active on Facebook in particular at Team Porcupine Real Estate on Facebook. Uh, you can also visit our website, which is porcupinerealestate.com. And there's a link there to a number of helpful resources, particularly if people are new to the state of New Hampshire. We have, for example, a list of all the tax rates by town, for the state, for the entire state. We have a lot of interesting and helpful blog posts regarding things like current use, uh, what, to what things to consider if building a brand new house on when you're buying land, uh, questions and answers on homesteading, and then a lot of information about the various regions around New Hampshire to help get you uh, acquainted and acclimated to this new market. So visit uh, porcupinerealestate.com and give us a call with any questions. Well, uh, thank you everybody for participating and um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Okay.